to start with uh, Professor Stout with uh, Access to Justice. Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> well, this has been uh, exciting for me. Um, it's interesting to be in a group that has this sort of focused agenda, a cause, if you will. Um, it's, um, I guess, the thing I've been involved in for the last 10 years also a cause, and it's been focused around access to justice and technology. But I have some roots in the sort of the themes that you've been talking about this morning. Um, 15 years ago, about this time, I had maybe five or eight million dollars and 15 or 20 um, market people and about 30 or 40 programmers working on the first version of Lexis that was delivered over the web. Um, I was for four years a vice president of Lexis on leave from this academic role. Um, so I have some history with, with all this work that, uh, that that's going on now. And I've, done the, 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 the analysis that, that David did earlier and we watched these companies merge together and so on. Um, and you know, so you have all these sort of reactions to, well, if you make that free will, I'm just going to pay for that, you know, all these kinds of things. So, um, and, and repeatedly I keep thinking, who's the audience, who's the, who's the customer, who's the end user, who, who, who is this really aimed at, who's going to get something out of this initiative? Um, and maybe there's a little bit of a way to begin thinking about that in the context of a very narrow little slice of a crusade that we've been on here um, for about 10 or 11 years. So um, what's this access to justice slice? Well, there's a massive need. There are 51 million people as of 2007 um, in need who are eligible for the Legal Services Corporation services. 17.6 million of them were children. That was an increase of 1.18 million from 2006, and it was before this crash that we've, we're experiencing now. So these numbers must be significantly larger than there aren't any new data available on the Legal Services Corporation site. Um, the Legal Services Corporation is the nationally funded source for about maybe a half, a third to a half of the money used for civil legal aid. Um, and their funded agencies do a million cases a year. Yet half of the people that come to those folks are turned away because they don't have the resources to take care of them. And every study that's been done by state justice communities shows that 80% of the legal needs of the poor and the working poor are unmet. That people figure out some other way to deal with things. Um, there's also a phenomenon that affects judges and clerks and court administrators, court administrators who are not as evil as I heard this morning. Um, <laughs> actually, they just have a job to do, right? Yeah. Right. Their job isn't to help you. Their customer is the judges and the, and the lawyers and the other people that are working their way through that system. And you come in and say, I want to go publish up and put it on the web. They say, well, that's nice. I'm busy. Right. I think that's mostly what's going on with them. And, and, and the, as, as, as you pointed out this morning, the chief judge is a, a politician. I'm going to do these little comments on things as I go along because I have all these things to say. Um, but um, and I, and we have some very good court administrators who work through this study. I can tell you about them. They were faced and have been faced and are continuing to be faced with massive numbers of people coming through their court systems unrepresented. And these are some basic numbers. Their numbers are, are much worse than this now driven largely by consumer issues and by foreclosure problems. That the numbers of unrepresented people who are being forced into courts to solve life, very important life problems is growing dramatically. So about 11 years ago, with some very wonderful partners, including the National Center for State Courts and State Justice Institute and um, a variety of other folks to help fund us, um, we, we tried to put together a project that would help address this issue by bringing new new eyes, new insights, new approaches to this problem. And we associated with our Institute for Design, and it's a systematic design um, expert named Chuck Owen. And we took teams of, of students uh, from the design school, who are all graduate students who were very clever people that helped design um, cell phones and desks and, 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 the, and, the, and the traffic flow for the museum campus at the, at the, at the uh, um, and Chicago Lakefront, things like that. And these people, and we, and we put them through a, a year-long process of research to try to understand the, the needs 
of self-represented people who were not getting their needs met by the courts. And to some extent, the customer law there was also the, <coughs> the court systems themselves, the court administrators, the judges, and so on. And this is sort of the, 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 the phasing of that work. Um, this is the result of the first couple of phases. It's a, a, a big research report um, attempted to identify barriers and employ system technology to, to fix the process. Um, so what do we find out? Well, cost is a barrier. They, they don't get lawyers because they don't have any money. Uh, most of the people attribute the cost of the court system to lawyers. Um, but apropos of almost everything that was talked about this morning, the, the huge problem in the middle of this whole process that we discovered was complexity. So I had this image of, of somebody with my iPad Oye app, right? And so I, I, I'm, I'm on the plane going home tonight, and I, I watched the carnage on Grey's Anatomy, everybody getting killed last night. Um, and then right after that, I, I bring up, you know, like Citizens United and page through that and enjoy myself doing that. And it says, who can read that case, right? You can't read that case. And, and I've been in this law business for 40 years. There's also this lack of legal representation, distrust of lawyers, lack of information about process and so on. Here was the fun stuff. We took these design students and my law students, we went to five different courts, and we did ethnographic research. A thing I recommend to you if you've been in a career for a long time and want to find out what's really going on in the shoes of the customer. We, we went out and stood at the, at the front door in Boulder, Colorado, um, uh, in the JonBenet Ramsey you know, courtroom, courthouse, and we waited for the doors to open at 7 o'clock in the morning. And we wandered through with the self-represented people, and we got, we got ourselves frisked. And we walked with them and talked to them, and we took their pictures if they let us and, and, and interviewed them. And then we found out what they did, and when they went through their court process, we asked them before what they were trying to get. And when they came out, we asked them, did you get what you wanted? What could be better except winning? Things like that. And it turns out that self-represented litigants are very committed and really engaged um, with a commitment to traditional court systems. They, they respect the judge and court administrative people a lot. But they also see this system as hostile, confusing, disoriented, inefficient. They, they find the buildings and the signage like completely confusing. The paperwork that, that, that's needed to do the process to get them through the any any simple little thing is massively baffling. I mean, they, they, they just can't figure it out. It's even difficult when the clerk, you go to the clerk's office and they say, well, fill out a form to get your case up on the, on the docket. They'll, and they'll give you the form. There's, there's no place to write there, right? You don't have a, there's no, place, no, there's no flat surface to lay down and write, write it out, even if you're filling it out by hand. They think that alternate dispute resolution is, is mysterious. Isn't the judge supposed to decide? I'll be, oh, go to the judge and the judge, why, do I, why would I want to go talk to you? They find hearings unnerving, dehumanizing, they wait forever. When they finally get their chance to speak, they're frequently told not to say what they want to say. When they win, which is occasionally the case, it takes forever, if ever, to try to collect on what they've achieved. So if they get a $500 judgment against their neighbor for knocking over the fence. How do you get the money? Doesn't he just pay me? Right. The German design students on our team said, well, doesn't everybody just have a credit card? Why don't you just charge off on their credit card? Well, those who are lawyers, you get that. It's just a whole new set of lawsuits to collect the money. That's what you get when you get the, you get the judge. All right. This is a little image, actually. This is an actual image. I think it's the seventh or eighth floor of the, of the Daily Center, the biggest courtroom in, in, um, in Illinois. And, you know, I, I, I thought that sort of the fuzzy aspect of it, the, sort of the otherworldly aspect of it, was really an accurate portrayal of the fuzz that people must see. And they come in there, and, and it's just like people running around. And I remember, you know, 40 years ago, going over there on, a, on an assignment from the law firm I was working on a file something, and that's how I felt. You know, it's, 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 it's like that. Um, so what were we about? Well, we're supposed to identify all these problems, try to get a new look at how to solve the problems, and then build some tools and prototypes that might solve some of those problems. A key set of the problems are, dealing with very simple things. 
I need a name change because I don't want to be known by my husband, the abuser's name anymore. I need a, a guardianship so my child can, can go to school in a district where they're not going to be threatened by a gang. Um, I need a divorce, and I haven't seen my husband for, for, for 15 years. We have no money, we have nothing else, and I want to get married again. Simple things that should be easy, right? It turns out that they're not, as we've just discovered. And so we put together a series of, of, of design suggestions, and from those design suggestions, then we build a prototype that pulled together about 10 of those solutions into a single prototype. And, and it sort of looked like this. We took a very simple procedure called the Joint Simplified Dissolution of Marriage Procedure, and we put it into a system that allowed a self-represented person to go to a website and walk down a path with these sort of avatar-like characters to justice. Pretty cool, huh? Well, it turns out that it's more powerful than that. They can walk through step after step and see progress as they move down. We drop them into the scene by identif they identify their name and sex right in the first screen. So a man or a woman drops into the scene and they become this traveler down the path. It also turns out that we could put all kinds of education here, right? And as we ask each question as we walk down the path, um, we can pop up definitions for every term that they're likely to fail to understand. Um, we can give them a map as to show them how far they've how far they've achieved. We can show them pictures of the documents. We can run a video and say, "This is what it's going to look like in the in the courtroom when you walk up in front of the judge. He'll be sitting up there, or she'll be sitting up there, and you'll be staying back here. And don't leave this spot. And you know, all those things are possible. So it's a fabulous just-in-time learning environment, educating the public about the law." developed by students in conjunction with these sort of organiz national organizations. Um, and it, it turns out when the, when the system, this is sort of the next step, they sort of walk down the step and they get to the courthouse. It turns out that when you test it, right, it tests wonderfully well. And people learn and, and can, can engage with this and do very complicated things if you break them down to very simple steps, step, 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 and learn as they go along what they need to know. But the only problem was, was that that prototype cost, oh, John, maybe $350,000? <laughs> that one little thing? Uh, yeah, I didn't get much of that, but yeah. <laughs> but John, John is, you know, actually, the other thing I noticed with, with, uh, with uh, sort of our team this morning is that the technologist and the, and the sort of the domain specialist pair, right, is a key element to success in this field. And we have one example back there with Oye. And John and I are sort of like that kind of crowd. We've been following John around for like 20 years, and just every time he comes up with a new idea, he says, oh, I think I'll try that. And then I put my name on it, and he does the work. You know, it's great. <laughs> That's great. You know, and Tom Bruce and, and Peter Martin were like that in, in Cornell as well. Um, so the solution to this is to build a tool that builds the, the guided interviews, right? And John's group, the Center for Computer Assisted Legal Instruction, had the rudimentary pieces of that because they had a, an authoring tool that, that very low um, tech authors, law professors, could use right, to build lessons, right, to teach the law, to law, law students. Right? So he took that, that, that core and built a solution provider that helps clerks in courts and legal aid lawyers and others build these guided interviews in a whole variety of things. And at first, it was to sit inside a structure that the Legal Services Corporation had developed of putting a website in every state that was the authentic source of legal aid information and resources, right? Step number one, very powerful concept that the Legal Services Corporation um, implemented through something called the Technology Innovation Grant System. Um, secondly, they put a, a national server for hot docs online up and made hot docs the standard back end document assembly tool that was given to them by Lexus and currently the new hot docs owner. Um, and then our stuff sort of sat on top of that. And so what, what ADJ Author did was substitute for a very formal business like interview that hot docs provides and put this sort of learning environment there instead. It turned out to be an extraordinary success. And I say that with all modesty because I've tried dozens of 
path-breaking things, and every one of them has been a failure. I've been, I've been trying things since 1978, and this is the first one that really, well, Lexus.com one. That was a good one. That, that, that made like a, maybe a billion of that, right? Some, some pile of that money. Um, but but this, is, this has been a great success. I mean, I, for example, in 1988, I wrote the first electronic casebook for law and predicted that there would never be another, you know, print casebook carried around by anybody. Everybody would carry around laptops instead. <clears throat> now they carry around laptops and these big fat books that I assign my students in my own classes. I mean, that's crazy. All right, so A to J Author was built. It connects the public to the courts and the legal system versus the, on, the, on the web using this infrastructure I've described. Um, it has the capability to do all this education, this training, and this interface capability. And this is sort of a little bit of a graphic about its success. There's 29 states that have active A to J author legal services or court-based development projects. Um, 438 active templates, that was, that's actually down from, we used to say 1,300, but it turned out that eight or 900 of them were like early versions that were still up on the national server that had to be sort of cleaned up. So there are 438 actively used A to J templates right now posted on the national server. Last year, 142,000 individuals use those tools to try to prepare a document or get their rights or figure out where to go or do something in the court system. And in the first quarter of 2010, 52,000 did, so we're on track for like 200, 220,000 users this year. And I think eventually that, that this will hockey stick, right? I think we're still sort of in the, the bottom end of this thing, and I think eventually there'll be a million a million, maybe a million a month, people using this tool um, to solve problems that they have in a variety of ways. Well, it turns out that in addition to being the front end of the document assembly and helping people put their documents together, um, that it also could be a website guide. So you could have somebody ask them a bunch of questions, and then instead of preparing a document using hot docs, you could just take them someplace on the web, just deliver them there. Um, in addition, if you wanted to do Online intake, if you're the seven legal services programs in Ohio and you wanted to allow people to get on a web page anywhere in the world, actually, but certainly anywhere in the state, at any time of the day or night or week or weekend, and find out if they're likely eligible for legal aid and if they have the kind of case that legal aid would cover in Ohio, and get to the right one of those seven organizations, right? You can go online go through an A to J author intake process, and your data can be dumped right into their case management software, PICA, and a, it's not really a complete case, it's like a proto case, and a holding area is created because there's a conflicts check, and some staffing work that follows that. But you're basically ready, right? And the best part of this that, that people in Ohio say is this, lots of people who they used to, to put into a big long telephone queue or tell them, tell them to come to their office on Thursday morning between 10 and 12. Lots of people who are in those queues or waiting in, the, in, the, in those offices don't have to go there anymore because they aren't eligible. And they find out by doing this website thing. Right? You save themselves and the organization lots of time and make the whole process more efficient as well as obviously more convenient, easier, for better for people involved. Turns out that you can put this in front of e-filing systems as well. Right? And we, we've been working with the um, Eastern District of Missouri in St. Louis, Federal District Court there, in a pilot project to build this set of front ends to um, the case management electronic uh, case filing system that is now in place in every district court and bankruptcy court in the country and every appellate court now in the federal system. And um, it, it's ready to go. Um, interestingly enough, we had sort of the opposite, the opposite administrator chief judge thing, right? So we had the, the clerk of the court and the administrators of the court were all ready to hook this right into to, uh, CME, ECF, and the judges said, yeah, I'm a little bit afraid of that going directly in. So they have now kiosks in St. Louis where you go and you do all this work, and instead of pushing the button and having to go right into the system, it goes over and prints off a bunch of stuff, the, the complaint and the, the cover sheet and all that stuff, and then, then the of the pro se litigant walks it over to the clerk's office, right, the clerk's desk, and then the clerk scans it in. <laughs> it's like, hello, <laughs> who can solve this problem for you? 
And the reason it's being done is because the judges don't want it to go right in. This is another sort of intersection point, Carl. The electronic filing system that's been put in place in the, in the federal system is essentially mandatory for every lawyer in every district court where it's, where it's implemented. Right? You have to use it in order to file something. You may have, there may be an exception occasionally, but you have to use it. I think every one of those sets of local rules say that if you're not a lawyer, you may not use it. You can't use it. And how's that for access to justice? Mm -hmm. You can't get into the court system unless you're a lawyer, unless you do it in paper. And all that convenient stuff about filing at 1159 only works if you're a lawyer. It doesn't work if you're a, a real person. Right? But this system is ready to at least take a, take a run at that. We've also had some folks who thought, oh, maybe this is transformative. And I love that notion. Well, I, man, maybe I could be involved in something transformative. Maybe I'll go with that. Um, and the notion is, is well, maybe you could face building code um, or building permits and and uh, liquor licenses and all kinds of administrative things. Maybe you could face the, all, the, all the legal and administrative and government needs of the public with these kinds of triage systems. And so you would come to one website, and if you had a, had a, a, a criminal problem or a, or a civil problem, you, you wouldn't have to be shunted off into, into the you don't qualify area of the process. You would, your data, instead of going into the holding tank with the legal aid, organizations in Ohio would go to the public defender of the proper county in Ohio and be ready for a treatment in that setting um, or any of the other varieties of places that you can imagine. And when you start thinking about that, it's like, whoa, maybe there's really some powerful stuff here that can happen you know, in terms of making legal processes, not raw data, but legal processes available to people who can then navigate them themselves with a lot of help all the time put together by law students and lawyers and folks and others. Um, so having this set of wild, wonderful insights, I teach in a law school, right? And I'm even having these meetings in law schools. Um, and, and I heard Tim say this morning that Stanford's doing some stuff that's sort of tied in with, with the, uh, the head of the law library there, having students involved in writing the synopses of the Supreme Court cases in California. And so uh, I sort of thought with a bunch of others, well, you know, there's 152,000 law students, and there are these million people that need help. And the law students really want some experience. They want to talk to people. They want to try to be a lawyer. They want to interact with the court system in any way they can. They'll take any kind of experience that they can get. And these people really need help, right? Um, so why don't we try to put all that together? And so we brought, we brought a bunch of people into this very room. We talked about it for a long time, and actually wrote a white paper. <laughs> Yeah, there's a white paper. I'm okay. All right. Um, <laughs> now what? Um, well, we had a couple of models that we looked at. Here's one model. We, we tried to set up a law review where instead of writing law review articles that people toss in the, in the, in the bottom of whatever drawer they have, they would write guided interviews. Right? And they would get credit like, like 10 students uh, 10, that you referenced. Google references these, these uh, synopses, and their name is in the, 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 the byline is there, so they got some visibility in Google. We thought, well, maybe we'll use that kind of, of, of high visibility and give them some credentials, and they, they can point to an employer to a place on the web where something they did is actually being used for people, and so on. Um, it's, a, it, it's been like pulling teeth to do this. You know, I, I do we have people that do it? Um, but, the, but the throughput is very, very thin. I mean, they just, there's a lot of other stuff in their lives, right? And, and this isn't that high visibility thing. It's not the law review, it's the editorial board. I made it look as law review as I could. Quite work. Um, this works better. This is, um, that, this is a, actually a different view of that same fuzzy picture I showed you of the, of the sixth floor of the Daily Center. Um, and that's one of my former students who now works for NTAP. And actually, there were three librarians who were pretending that they are in deep need of, uh, of uh, legal services, um, and they don't know what to do. And there's some computers along that wall, um, right in front of the man with the red shirt. And they have these document assembly, ADJ guided interviews available to them, and people are being helped through those processes, helped to find things on the Illinois Legal Aid Online website that has all this information for Illinois, and also helped to go through the interview process because a lot of people don't like to touch mice and 
don't know much about it. There's still is some digital divide thing going on out there. And you don't need to be a lawyer. You don't need to be certified. All you need is some, a, 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 maybe a five, six hours of training. And first-year students love this because they can put something on their resume. They can experience the courthouse a little bit um, and also feel that, that rush of helping people. And we get a lot of people signing up for this. There are 150 volunteers so far. And we've helped a lot of pro se visitors using this method. This approach to helping educate the public about the law is central to the emerging mission of librarians and law librarians in Illinois. I've been trying to think how many, I think there are like 16 or 17 counties now in Illinois where there is a self-help web center like this that's staffed either by the, the county law librarian or the county library, not the law library, just the regular county library. And they have space in those place, places. We're negotiating with space on the spectacular 29th floor of the uh, Daly Building right now with the librarian of the Cook County Law Library. Um, th this, is, this is a place where law librarians can touch the public in, in, in a way that's protected and effective and powerful because these tools can be vetted by the most expert folks in those fields. And the librarian does not have to give legal advice. They can just help them find the right thing and help them with any difficulty they have with the process. Um, maybe these are enough as ways to get students energized. Um, I'm trying a new way in the fall, um, and I've offered a four credit clinic, basically. Um, and I'm going to make students go to the web center and figure out what, what people need, and then come back and write some of these tools and help deliver them. Um, and um, they're getting four credits. I tried this 10 years ago, and nobody signed up. And my daughter was a student here, and she didn't even sign up. <laughs> uh, she's a legal aid lawyer in, in, in Cleveland, so you'd think she would tie into this. Um, but I got 16 students for the fall, and um, um, we're real excited about this going forward. So we'll see if that, if that works as a way to get students involved in this. We have two and a half minutes, or a minute and a half, or something for questions. Suggestions? Do I have it wrong? Yes, sir. Come here. Yeah, um, Andrew Fuller. Um, okay, so there. Um, Andrew. The um, for uh, in particular for the, the sort of guided interview uh, product, uh, what, what would be the success metrics? What do you look at to you know confirm for yourself and then also for promotional purposes? That, you know, this, well, is this, the, this is sort of like a, they have these missiles that are launch and forget. Mm -hmm. You just shoot them off, and you, then you fly away, and then they just go on their own and find the target. Um, these are a little like that. Um, the only metric that we're really getting now is how many of the interviews result in an assembled document. Right? Um, and um, I want to say A to J interviews, that number is like 70% or something like that. And that may be more of a measure of is, is the interview too long, is, is people don't, just don't want to finish, it gets too hard to do. Um, there's no, nobody's doing anything now, although there are places like Idaho where every state Supreme Court form um, of any frequent use has been converted into this thing, and they have a very high penetration rate for ADJ author guided interviews there. Where we could probably try to do a study there and follow up, like code the, the documents that are produced this way. We, we don't have anything. But it's, one, it's wonderfully successful. Yeah. Where do you want to be five years from now? Retired, playing golf. I'd like to see this like um, massively utilized, um, and I think that's going to happen. I think it's just going to happen. Um, I don't know, John. We have we have a five-year plan. We're, we're doing a sustainability we're analysis, <laughs> um, and I, I I'd love to take your input. So you, you tell me where we should go five years from now. I spoke last year almost at this exact date to the, to the um, Canadian administrative law judges um, on the theory that the whole administrative law world is, is a perfect place for this to apply for food stamps, social security, do other, provide all kinds of other avenues for redress and, and gather up information and teach people things. Um, I think that, that's, a, that's a heavy place to go um, and we can, we can work in that space. Um, I'd like to see students more involved and students more um, engaged and, and more 
value for the work that they do in the space, and we'll see if the course helps them. Jack, you're up. 